can see my name. One scene never forgotten. Okay. Um, I've been told to stick to my I've been told to stick to my speech by somebody in the audience. I'm looking at now, but I won't say who it is. Um, really, when I got the feeling of the atmosphere in the conference today, I wanted to throw this in the dustbin. You know, because sometimes you prepare a speech and suddenly your mood takes you on a totally different frequency. So at the moment, I'm in between frequencies. So I'll introduce myself. My name is Peter Eyre. Some people refer to me as a Middle East consultant. I don't know where that came from, but it's, a it's attached to me. I'm also taught, told I'm a political analysis. Do you know what this word means? Because I don't. But it's a tag I've acquired. And part of this is, can we make a difference? Uh, just to give you some idea, uh, I will go through my own personal history. Unfortunately, I made the mistake of joining the military at a, the tender age of 15 years, which is, to me, too early. And uh, after my initial training, I end up immediately as a very young boy in areas of conflict, primarily in the Middle East, but also on the other extreme, in the jungles of Borneo, fighting terrorism there. But my interpretation of what I was doing as a military man and since this time when I've become a consultant, a totally different outlook on life. Because I would see myself going down a river in Borneo, and I would see people in the boats firing their machine guns into the bush, into the trees on either side as we approach a village, like a scaremonger to frighten people. Not knowing if there were women and, chil and children behind those bushes. And so you become very conscientious of your actions. I would like to say that I've led a pretty good life. I don't think I've injured anyone, but my conscience tells me what I was doing was wrong. And, and this is all through my life, like this situation. And then um, I, I got into high positions and, and joined NATO. I was at the NATO headquarters intelligence. So I've gone from one extreme to the other. And then eventually I got into police control in a major city overseas. And I, then I started to look, look things totally different. And then eventually I came down to earth. And I left my beautiful uh, materialistic life in Australia and came back to England. And then in 2006 and 2007, I decided to become a volunteer down in the jungle in southern India, working with local people, local tribal people. And this altered my uh, outlook on life completely. It brought me down to earth. That I no longer wanted the materialistic life. I no, no longer wanted to see any conflict or war. And so I became an independent activist. And you could say, can one person make a difference? I didn't know this, but suddenly I'm supporting the people of Gaza and West Bank, the Palestinians. The next year, I find myself in Larnaca in Cyprus. Because of my military and my uh, maritime experience, I was crew member of one of the three Gaza boats. And I have in my possession the flag from the back of this boat as a momentum for that. But we had a technical problem, and we didn't make it. So I had to return to England, not achieving my goal. And a lot of people don't understand what we call geopolitics of the world. And you have to understand that Greed creates terrorism, and the two together create poverty. And this is what we have to eliminate. So we'll come back to the, the main theme now, which is human rights in Afghanistan, and can we make a difference? So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this first conference of the European Campaign for Human Rights in Afghanistan. Dr. Nasimi, family, members of staff and volunteers have worked very hard to make this new project a reality. And so today, we see the results of those efforts. But before highlighting some aspects of the outstanding human rights issues in Afghanistan, I would like to read an extract from the commitment made by the Afghan government. I would like to emphasize it doesn't matter which government makes the commitment, what they commit themselves to and what they actually do are two different things. So you can have a law for human rights, but the next week they can forget it. It's whatever is compatible and the mood of the day. So the 
government of Paki uh, Pakistan, my God, sorry about that. The, the government of Afghanistan assumes a very serious, the serious responsibility in regards to human rights. It is laid down in the constitution of Afghanistan and international human rights treaty to which the state of Afghanistan is uh, signed up to. The government and its international partners should ensure that any negotiations relating to national reconciliation and Afghanistan institution building process includes the human rights priorities as part of its platform. The participation of women and other relevant stakeholders and representatives are part of the Afghan civil society and must be ensured. So that is the, that's embedded in the law. So as the human rights group, we can use that tool to our advantage because it is written in the law of the country. The problem is, as someone mentioned, I think at the back here earlier, that if anyone wants to form something like this in Afghanistan, they're not going to be around for long. And you know this is fact. This is not democracy. This is not freedom of speech. I must remind you that Afghanistan remains one of the poorest countries in the world, with an estimated one-third of its population living in absolute poverty, and 37% very, very close to the poverty line. If you add those two together, you're looking at around 70% of poverty. That's a tremendously high figure and should never be allowed. They're sitting on incredible wealth in Afghanistan. People, you know, underestimate the wealth in your country. Just around Kandahar is a massive copper ore body that would make any country rich. You've got oil, gas, whatever you want is in Afghanistan. And there was an announcement, uh, I think, in the last six months. Suddenly, some guy in America stood up and said there's incredible wealth in Afghanistan. Well, I hate to remind the gentleman, but I know even 25 years ago, using satellite technology, we already knew the riches of Afghanistan. And in geopolitics, those riches become part of the game. So human rights is a very fine line. What is human rights? In actual fact, um, war crimes is very, very close to human rights. And poverty is very close to human rights. Of course, all these together create the problems and the issues in Afghanistan now. So um, the issues that we can come up with in Afghanistan, uh, and this is up to the current time, Afghanistan has a very high child mortality rate. And life, life expectancy is very limited. The health system is non-existent. And the second highest uh, maternal mortality rate in the world. That's an incredibly high figure. And, and one relates to the current war that's going on. And then when you counterbalance that with the wealth that's hidden under the soil, it doesn't make sense. You're looking at a country that if the resources and if the country was allowed to be self-governed and extract the mineral wealth that lies beneath the soil, you're looking at Afghanistan as being another Dubai, but you know that Afghanistan is not another Dubai. So it doesn't make sense. Now, some figures from Oxfam. You'll have to excuse, excuse my eyes because I've just had two operations, even one yesterday on my eyes, so I get a lot of watering and I've forgotten my drops. Sorry about that. Oxfam, this is this year, May 2011. There is a serious risk that Afghanistan military and police violations of human rights and humanitarian law will escalate unless adequate accountability mechanism is put in place. In the report, it accuses Afghan security personnel and various abuses against civilians, including killing, torture, recruitment, and sexual abuse of children, and mistreatment of people under detention. It says Afghan security forces were responsible for at least 10% of 2,777 civil deaths in the year. That is this year, so it's ongoing. Oxfam accuses key players of paying more attention to building up the numbers of Afghan soldiers than developing the infrastructure of the country. There is no infrastructure, there is no employment. 
There's very little facilities, and you all know this. In addition to this, uh, it says an estimated 40,000 Afghan police have no training whatsoever. How can you put people in such a powerful position? You know, whether it's military or police, how can you put people into such an authoritative position with no training? That doesn't make sense. And so you get this tremendous rush to employ soldiers and, and policemen to try and replace eventually the soldiers which will eventually leave, not totally, but will leave. You can't replace them with untrained, undisciplined people. And that's the scenario that's going on at the moment. The human rights situation in, Afghan, in Afghanistan faces many challenges. After many de de decades of conflict, long-standing human rights problems exist, both in the cultural sense, in the ethnic minority sense, in the tribal sense. There is very weak governance and extreme poverty that is compounding each and every day. The Human Rights Commission revealed that 69% of nearly 7,000 people that were interviewed identified themselves or their immediate families as a direct victim of serious human rights violations, including unlawful killing, torture, disappearance and displacement. We're now looking at a conflict area of approximately 30 years and it's ongoing. There's no end in sight. Addressing the difference between women and men in Afghanistan has been recognized as an important part of the country's development strategy. Analysis of the situation has indicated that the nation's women are amongst the worst in the world.